when we build a computer, we are building a CPU, which is a central processing unit. That's the sort of smallest component which we can call a computer. It takes input and information from the outside world and processes it. In the next course that we teach on this information, we surround the CPU with other extra things like uh, memory management systems and cache and networking and input and output devices that allow the device uh, to be more complete, more secure, and interact more with the outside world. For now, all we're going to build is the central part of this, the core elements, which is the central processing unit. And again, we have everything we need to build one. Uh, we're just going to start to put it together. We want to be able to automate the process for this machine to execute one instruction after the other. This is called programming. We're going to make a programmable machine and then we're going to provide it with a list of instructions and it's going to do one thing and then another. That's the whole sort of process. But what does this machine look like and how do we build it? So this is going to be what we do in the next few videos. <clears throat> the general idea of the design of this machine is that it's going to execute instructions. It's going to execute a series of instructions. These instructions, again, are just a list of control logic that tells each individual component what to do. But we have to get that instruction from somewhere, and then we have to do that instruction. And this process we call the fetch execute cycle. First, we grab that instruction from memory, probably. We load that instruction into a register from memory. And then we execute that instruction using the hardware that's in the CPU. This fetch execute cycle is the fundamental um, sequence for execution of code in any computer. Uh, and the, the key difference here is that the fetch part has to be the same for any instruction because before we fetched it, we don't know what instruction we're fetching. It could be an instruction to do math, or it could be instruction to make a decision, or it could be an instruction to load information from some other source. Once that instruction has been brought into the computer and then understood, decoded, uh, then we can execute it, and that can be different for every instruction, but the fetch part has to be the same. And so we're going to fetch an instruction, and then we're going to execute it, and then we're going to fetch another instruction. These instructions, again, I sort of talked about this already, these instructions are going to be single um, low-level uh, events, single low-level pieces of action uh, that the computer is going to execute. Uh, in general, we don't write in assembly language. We write in a high-level language, which a compiler then will take and translate into machine code instructions. People typically don't write in assembly language these days, although there's some applications that it's useful or efficient to write in assembly language. Uh, but in general, we write in compilers, and then the compiler will convert it down into the machine code. When it comes to designing a computer then, what we need to do is look at the language that this computer is going to implement, the, the, the actual machine language this computer will execute, and then build out the hardware that we need to fetch those instructions in that language from memory somewhere, bring them in, decode them, understand them, execute them, complete the result, and put the result back somewhere. So that's going to be our incremental design process, where we're going to look at uh, the instructions that we're interested in executing, and we're going to build hardware that can execute the instruction, and then we're going to look at the next instruction and say, we also want this computer to do this. Can the hardware we have execute this new instruction? Yes? Great, we're done. No? Now we need different hardware. And then we're going to build out a complete set of hardware that's going to be able to execute all of the instructions that are in our assembly language. In general, assembly languages and the hardware to execute them get developed and sort of evolved in parallel. We need a new instruction, the world says, and so we need to build new hardware that can do it. Or our hardware has these limitations, and so we need a new instruction. They sort of go step by step. We're going to start with an assembly language that we generally understand. Well, maybe we understand it, maybe we don't. And we're going to build out that assembly language and the computer hardware to execute it step by step together. The, the instructions themselves, the machine code itself, is going to be specified in, the, in, in terms of opcodes, which are a, a small set of bits that's going to tell the computer what we want to do and operands, each of which is a small set of bits that are going to tell the computer on what we wish to operate. So if we want to add two numbers together, first of all, we need a place to store those numbers. These are going to be our registers. And we need a machine that can add. This is going to be our arithmetic and logic unit. And then we need to specify which registers we're interested in 
And then those pieces of information need to be presented to the ALU. And we need to say what we want to actually do. In this case, we're going to add. And then we need to tell the machine where we want to put the result. Again, into another register. So for MIPS, now MIPS is the assembly language that we're going to use in this class. For MIPS, we have three operands. We have two operands that are going to be the source of information for this operation. And we're going to have one operand, which is going to be the destination for the result of this operation. And we have an op code that's going to tell us what we want to do. So an instruction might look like add, put the result in A0, whatever happens to be stored in S2 and S3. And that's going to take S2 and S3, add them together, and put the result into A0. Other assembly languages, other computer fundamental computer languages, have different processes. x86 is the assembly language that is fundamental to most um, you know, laptop and desktop PCs these days. It only uses two operands. One of the source operands is also the destination. So this, I want to say add A1, B1. What this does is it takes A1 and B1, whatever they happen to be, adds them together, and then puts the result back into A1. And so there's some limitations on what can be done in this kind of a language that are not present in what can be done in the, in the three operand assembly language. The other really common assembly language, by the way, uh, that is prevalent across the board these days is ARM. And you learn about ARM in our Computer Science 301 class. Uh, and it is also a three operand uh, instruction. So we want to be able to specify these all in the instruction that we're going to fetch from memory and then present to the CPU to be executed. We're going to do our design incrementally. And again, we're going to build a general computer uh, and then we're going to add some MIPS specific details. But the, the way that we're going to build this general computer will be very compatible with MIPS once we actually add MIPS in. Because MIPS is very, very complicated. It's a complete real assembly language that is used in things like digital cameras, um, uh, routers and, and uh, Wi-Fi routers and things like that. It's, it's used in, in common today. And let me just show you really quickly the complete specification. I believe this is the MIPS one. Yeah, this is the, uh, and we built this card uh, for, um, for use at the University of Regina because uh, I didn't find one that was really good. <laughs> and so if you want to use this, feel free. Uh, and it's a, it's a detailed uh, list of all of the instructions that are available and how they actually work. Uh, and it's pretty complicated. You will learn all of these instructions and it'll be very clear once we're done. Um, but we don't want to start here because this is very intimidating. There's lots and lots of stuff here. We want to start with a few simple instructions and then add more. This is what we call an incremental design. So an incremental design then needs to start at the very beginning with the fetch part of the fetch execute cycle. The fetch part, all we need is to grab a piece of information from memory somewhere and bring it into uh, the computer to execute. The place we're going to put the instruction is going to be called the instruction register, but we need to figure out which instruction we want to uh, bring in. What instruction are we doing? Now, if we have a list of instructions, we want to do instruction one, then instruction two, then instruction three, we could use a counter that would count through the instructions, right? We built a counter before in our sequential logic design process. So we build a counter, and that counter just says, do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then somewhere in memory, and we'll talk about how this happens later, somewhere in memory is a list of instructions stored in memory at address 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We do each instruction in order. Okay, That's the whole point, is to create a big list of things we want to do and have the computer just do it all at, at once or all very quickly. So we're going to build a counter that is going to store the address of the next instruction to execute. And we're going to call that the program counter, or PC. These, are, these uh, abbreviations are going to be very common. There's going to be an awful lot of them, and you're going to learn them and memorize them. But as we get to be building this stuff, it'll all become clear. So we're going to uh, build a counter called a program counter. We're calling it a register because it's actually a, um, it's a storage location. And as we'll see later on as we build it, there are other things besides counting that this can do. This is a storage location uh, that is going to hold the current value for the instruction that we're executing. And we can call it it's sort of a pointer. It's a, it's a pointer in memory to an address of a piece of information that we're interested in. 
In this case, the piece of information we're interested in is the instruction. It's the collection of ones and zeros that tells all of the hardware what to do. We store that in the program counter, and that program counter now can just cycle up and say, I want to do instruction one, two, three, four, five. And as we'll see later on, there are other things we can do. When we make decisions, uh, we may want to be able to put the program counter in different places in the memory, as we'll see. So the program counter, or the PC, takes its output, and that output is presented to the instruction memory, because the instruction memory is the big chunk of memory where the instructions are stored. Somewhere in the past, something, maybe a person, maybe a compiler, put the instructions in memory, and then the program counter just grabs them, fetches them from memory, and then uses them to tell the rest of the computer what to do. So this is the complete fetch hardware. Now again, these are just boxes. These are generic boxes, but what you'll see is that um, each individual box, we know how to build it. We can build a counter. We can build a register to store the result of a counter. That's all what's going on in here. We also can build memory. We've got all sorts of processes and techniques to build memory. So that memory is going to be addressed by the program counter. In other words, the program counter contains a memory address, and the ad memory address gets presented to the instruction memory. The instruction memory will load the word at that memory and bring it in and use that to tell the computer what to do. That's fetch. That's it. That's all there is. So the address of the next instruction to execute is held in the program counter. It's presented to the instruction memory and the instruction memory loads that instruction. Okay, so the program counter register only needs to hold a value. So D flip flops are fine, good enough. The memory itself is only gonna hold instruction data. Later on, we can talk about how that instruction data gets into memory, but we can have a ROM. And in fact, for some really low level processes, uh, you all you have to do is read information. You never actually have to change the value that's at the instruction memory. And so that can be a really low level read-only memory, right? And then we'll, we can build RAM out to do that as well. And again, the program counter provides an address of the instruction. Uh, the address is presented inside the memory to a decoder, which is gonna activate a single memory word line, which is gonna load an instruction and present that instruction to the rest of the computer. Just as an aside, typically we're using 32-bit computers, and that means there's four billion possible memory words. Uh, but this is going to be heavily constrained. The other thing that we'll see as a just as a hint for later on is that typically memory is eight bits wide. And so a 32-bit uh, word, a 32-bit instruction, uh, which is MIPS or 32-bit instructions, actually requires four loads because each is eight bits wide. And so we have to load four pieces of information from memory to get a complete instruction. Those are all implementational details, which we will poke at later. But for now, it's enough to say program counter addresses memory, memory loads an instruction into the computer.